Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve barakallahu fikum fi hadha şehr kerim. Ramadan is obviously one of the individual ibadats. It's not so much like the Hajj or the Salat, which are really congregational. Ramadan really affects us as individuals primarily. But it also has collective aspects, which are some of the sweetest things that we remember of the month when it's done. The gatherings for Iftar and the gathering for the Eid, most obviously, but also the uh, prayer of Tarawih. In these Covid times, these congregational things are rather thinner, depending on local rules. Uh, and perhaps that's one of the things that we will recall from this Ramadan, that we missed the sociality of it. Al-Jama'atu Rahma wal Furqatu Adab. In coming together there is mercy and in separation there is a punishment. We are social animals and our world has too many solitaries in it. We even have a ministry of loneliness in the United Kingdom now. First country in history, as far as I know, to have a minister of loneliness because it's reached epidemic proportions. And what do you expect from a culture that declares the individual to be the measure and the end of all things? But in the month of Ramadan, we traditionally experience a lot of collectivity. We are more in the mosques, and there's iftar, and there is suhoor, and it isn't just with neighbors and the members of our mosque jama'ah, but also with family, particularly. Ramadan is an intergenerational time. And this, again, is very unmodern. In the modern world, there is uh, an ever-growing generation gap, and the old are hardly seen by anybody at all. Uh, in a traditional society, of course, the generations are squeezed together and often live together under one roof so that the wisdom of the old can be benefited from by the new generation and some of the pressure is taken off the harassed and exhausted and hardworking parents. So Ramadan is a time for children as well. And it's a time that children often look forward to, whether or not they're old enough to fast. They get very excited at iftar time. They certainly get excited at the time of Eid. There is a strange festive dimension to Ramadan that kids really aspire to and, and enjoy. And in many Muslim countries you have cartoons, fawazir, sugar dolls, coloured lights in the streets. It has that strange Ramadan nighttime party uh, dimension, which is part of the, the delightfulness of traditional Muslim cultures. So it's a Ramadan for children. Uh, and it's a time when they tend to be more open to learning about Deen. And in our time, these opportunities have become rarer. It's an age of loneliness, even for those who are still physically living together, because everybody is on a screen. They sit together in the evening, perhaps, if they're not in the separate bedrooms, but everybody's looking at something quite different on a screen. So the family is together, but not together. And parents need to watch that very carefully. Not just because you don't know what's on those screens that your kids are looking at, but also because this is something more of furqa than of jama'a, something more of divine disapproval than of the natural togetherness. The basic jama'a in Islam is the jama'a of the, the family. <clears throat> now, there are so many hadiths in which the Holy Prophet emphasizes the importance of not just educating children and providing them with basic religious education and giving them Qur'an and so forth, but uh, nourishing them. <coughs> and this nourishment <coughs> is not expressed in the language of ta'lim, which is like formal education, the kind of thing that would happen in the maktab, but is to do more with tarbiyah and ta'deeb. We use quite a different kind of uh, expression. Tarbiyah <coughs> comes from the Arabic word rabba, meaning to grow. So just as in this corner of the CMC garden, the daffodils are out. So also uh, we cultivate families. 
and this is part of the husband-wife relationship as, as it were uh, a crop is growing up and we need to be good shepherds and good farmers maintaining the crop we don't just sow the fields and then go off somewhere but we watch things very carefully before they mature and come to harvest so that's the idea of tarbia bringing things up looking at the rose bush seeing what fertilizers might be necessary when it needs to be mulched when it needs to be pruned sometimes chastisement is necessary when it needs to be trained perhaps against the war uh, this is necessary with all living things and with one's own children it is vitally important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say <coughs> لا تزير وزيرة وزيرة أخرى. No soul burdened will bear the burden of another. But we also know that bad upbringing produces damaged children and that the damage they cause in turn is ultimately kind of our fault. So Allah says, قو أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا. Ward off from yourselves and from your families a fire. In other words, keep your kids just as you wouldn't want them to uh, put their fingers in an open fire or in the barbecue. So similarly, you don't want them to go near the sources of the divine anger. And the child, when it's young, is the greatest responsibility anybody will ever assume. And in our culture, the schools don't teach you about parenting and it's far from the preoccupations of teenage boys and teenage girls, babies, responsibility. It's not part of their conversation at all in this strange and, <coughs> in many ways, biophobic uh, society that industrial humanity has, has inflicted upon itself. But the believer sees in the child a precious gift and an amana, a responsibility. Because while we are accountable for the procreation, the actual creation is from God. The soul comes from the divine. This nafqa ruh, the breathing in of the spirit, which happens after a certain period of time in the miraculous qarar makin, the safe resting place of the womb, is uh, the insufflation of the spirit which is that basis for the bowing down of the angels to Satan Adam alayhi salam, that first and most <laughs> extraordinary and startling divine commandment. <laughs> so the little kids are very cute and we know we need to restrain their wilder urges but at the same time when we look at them we recognize that what we are seeing is a witness to the divine. The spirit is there. It's not fully connected to the moral life and to explaining itself and impulse control because it's in a form and in a mind which is still learning, still embryonic really. And it takes a long time before it really flourishes and assumes moral spiritual responsibility. <clears throat> but it, the soul is still there. So in some countries they say that when the baby cries, I can't understand what the baby is saying, but it's actually praying for its parents. That's a tradition. That the spirit is there, even though the child is disconnected from speech, bayan, ordinary communication, but the spirit is fully there, which is why in Sharia, to kill a child is equivalent to killing an adult. However brilliant that adult's education might be, it's still the same crime. <clears throat> and of course, the unborn insult child is is the same. So we hold in our hands this very important, this very precious amana and we have to make them grow well, not to stult them. Uh, if the green fly come, we get rid of the green fly carefully. If they're growing in the wrong direction, being pushed by a contrary wind, well we find ways of supporting the plant so that it continues to grow and fulfill its uh, potential. Much of it is about protection, protecting the, the fitra on which it has been created. But there's another word which the Holy Prophet uses, sallallahu alayhi wa which is ta'deeb, 
uh, which is a causative form of the word adab, courtesy. He says, alayhi salatu wasalam, adabani rabbi fa ahsana ta'dibi. My Lord has given me adab and has given me beautiful adab. We often use this adab in the context of education. Ta'dib al-sibyan, we say, giving adab, giving education to <coughs> children. Now, the word ta'dib, adab, is related to an Arabic word, ma'daba, <coughs> which actually means a banquet, a place where everybody in the tribe gathers together and a baby camel is slaughtered and people are feasting. <coughs> it's a kind of joyful thing. So when we are inculcating adab in the child, what is the banquet which we are inviting the child to, at which it must maintain correct adab? Well, the banquet is the recollection of the day of Alastu bi Rabbikum, Am I not your Lord? The banquet is the uh, celebration of the remembrance of <coughs> our transcendent origin <coughs> and hence of the nobility of Bani Adam. Karamna Bani Adam. We have ennobled the descendants of Adam. <coughs> so there is a, a da'wah, an invitation to <coughs> a banquet at which of course one has to show due courtesy and all of religion in a sense is simply the courtesy that one shows when one is invited to the banquet of Rabbul Alameen which is our lives, the amazing world and uh, accepting everything that he puts in our plates. <coughs> so children uh, do not just need information, they do need how to make wudu and do those basic things but more than that, they need something that will nourish the soul and keep them upright and growing well as Muslims when they're finally out in the world and away from parental scrutiny. And <coughs> that is something that is inspirational, by which I don't mean the kind of excitement of seeing an Islamic celebrity in person and getting her autograph. That's not it. That's just nafs, really. But instead, the child's innate capacity to recognize the divine and the sacrality of things, which comes from the alas to be rabbikum and comes from the fitra, has to be protected. Just as we protect the child from traffic, we should protect the child from ugliness, from that which damages its spirit. Always surround the child with beauty. Always surround the child with harmonious sounds. Always keep the child away from anything that might traumatize or scratch the softness, the neonatal tenderness of its heart. Always be protective of the child and keep away anything that is dark, demonic, egotistic. And the child will naturally be nourished by that because it's our nature to be inclined towards what is beautiful. It's not our nature to be inclined towards what is ugly. Part of the strange, distasteful perversity of modernity is that we really like horror films or we like to see atrocities or some outrageous thing. And this is, this is really sick. It's not the hum nature of the human heart to want to look at ugliness and misfortune. The soul naturally is a beautiful thing, remembering the divine beauty and wants to see beauty in the world. So an exposure of the child to the magnificence of Islamic civilization is really important. Showing them the beauties of Islamic art. <coughs> Take them to <coughs> the British Museum. They may groan a bit, but take them to the British Museum and say, look, everybody wants to see the Islamic stuff. Did you see that Quran and all of the non-Muslims goggling at the beauty of it? Did you see those textiles? Did you see that glasswork? Did you see this? And that gives them a sense of pride in their Islamic identity <coughs> and an awareness that religion is about ihsan, doing the beautiful and producing what is beautiful. Show them the magnificence of the traditional mosques of Islam. Ideally travel with them to some of the great places of Islam so they can absorb in their little souls the magnificence and the dignity and the serenity and the, the majesty of those places. Keep them away from anything that is derivative second-rate, corny, merely inspirational. 
this is really important. From an early age, their soul should have the sense that in Islam reposes everything that is true and beautiful and compassionate and harmonious and symmetrical. And that everything that disturbs that comes from nafs, ego, extraneous things. <clears throat> this is particularly important in our age. And the month of Ramadan is a time when we can sometimes travel with them to Muslim countries, perhaps spend Ramadan in Al-Quds, spend Ramadan in Konya, spend Ramadan in a place where you can really see a traditional Muslim society still more or less functioning and get a sense of the naturalness and the beauty of that environment and of its sacred spaces. This is really important in cementing their sense of Islamic identity. And then, when they can, helping them to do their first fast, making a fuss of them, make them feel that this is really a great achievement, making sure people know about it and praise them, because the, the, the child's uh, desire there is not so much to be arrogant, but to be affirmed and to feel secure. And when adults and people that the child respects affirm the child, the child feels reinforced and feels uh, more steady. So, yeah, the biggest responsibility is the one which you take on when for the first time you hold in your hands a human life, a baby, a child, a soul. No more uh, enormous amana. Uh, and cultivating the akhirah of that child is an enormous responsibility. And in the time of Ramadan, we can introduce them to some of these beautiful things. We can introduce them to beautiful people, to beautiful sights, to something that helps them to feel really proud of the greatness of membership of this Ummah and of uh, membership to uh, the way of its founder, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So inshallah, this will be a good Ramadan, not just for ourselves, but for our children. And a Ramadan that when they're adults, they will look back to saying, Ramadan was so great when I was a child. We really used to enjoy Ramadan and we had colored lights and we had presents and we had visitors. And everything was amazing. And I did my first fast and I was so good all day long and my parents praised me and just make it a happy and a luminous and an unproblematic memory because there's so much in the world now that, that will cloud and damage and crack the pure mirror of their souls. Let the, the basic forms of religion be something that they always look back to with nostalgia and happiness. So may Allah, inshallah, make this a good Ramadan for us and for our families. Make it a time of tathbeet, of strengthening our iman and our solidity in this deen and help, it, help families to come together again, not just nuclear families, but uh, extended families as well. Uh, make the older people fully included so we can benefit from their experience and support them in their difficulties and inshallah bring us safely to their aid as better Muslims, as deeper Muslims, as more thankful Muslims and as families whose internal ties are strengthened and better than ever before. Barakallahu feekum wa taqabbala siyamakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.